She is an engineer by training and has a lot of research experience and real world experience with um, technology and apps and um, other kinds of uh, uh, innovative ways to engage the research community. So he's going to be talking to us more broadly about the concept of innovation and trying to help um, plant some seeds for where to start and how, how, how our research community can take advantage of his expertise and be thinking in very innovative ways. And then we're also going to have some examples of, of innovative types of research that will be presented by um, Dr. Rashida Chandler, who is an assistant professor with us in the School of Nursing as well. And I talked to Dr. Chandler earlier and she's got lots of slides and lots of presentation, lots of lots of information. So she may not be able to talk about all of her studies, but uh, once we hear about um, what she has on her um, agenda and some things that you may want to hear about in particular, we can help guide her what to focus on. So that is the point of our time today. And I will let Dr. Chi um, take the mic. So thank you, Drena, for introduction and the uh... Yeah, so the reason uh, I, I decided to present this uh, presentation today is that last year uh, we performed uh, some survey on the innovations and then at the time uh, a lot of people have uh, already have their own good idea of innovations, but they mentioned about this, uh, they don't know where to start. So that was, that's the reason why uh, so I decided to present with that topic. Okay, so let me briefly review the, what the innovation was uh, we talked about last year. So basically everyone has his own definitions. So I just took a copy of the book of the innovations and some different person's so definitions. But the, uh, in the business world, uh, so innovation, is a key for them to survival of of the com uh, of a company. So the business schools in England is a very famous people in uh, there. Just create a book called the managing managing innovations. It's uh, published in two thousand thirteen, and there they made a pretty good argument about innovations. The the author Tid and Besset, Besant defined innovation as a process instead of some uh, something or as an object. So the, through the innovation process, so company will develop new ideas through the searching for the previous ideas and then select from the search and then implement it to the, their product or services in order to capture value, in other words, to make money. So the, in our framework, the innovation is actually trained as a PhD program research. So the basic research is a nothing but literature review and then from the literature review, you select what kind of uh, tools you're gonna use to tackle your problem. And then all those uh, through the research activities and you get some result. So there's a, basically the process of innovation is search, select, implement, and capture. So here's some sample. What is the value to achieve from your innovation. So in order to find the, or define the value, you need to first define the pain you are having. So most, if you have a, some dead rug in your work and there's a people usually say that it's the PIA, right? So that is the pain you want to reserve. So the, by removing pain, then you get, what you want, that's the value you can be achieved from innovation. So the, uh, if you have an actual pain, like a, you got a cut or you got a cold, and then you search for medicine. It's the same procedure. You search for painkiller, which could be solution to the problem you're experiencing. And then from that 
uh, search, you select one of those, they could achieve the value, which is the pain relief. And then, so, so you take the painkiller. So, and then you finally get relieved or not. So that's, that's the uh, sample of, uh, process. And the, through the process, there are four types of innovations. Uh, there's so-called routine innovation. So the, this is uh, more like everyday people, just some people do not want to stay where they are. They just want to think about something to change on whatever they are doing to get more out of it. So that's so that thing, that kind of thing is called uh, as a routine innovation. And there's a more like an incremental. So the every year or every month, they grow a little bit more and more. So that is the routine innovation. In contrast, there is a discontinuous innovation and uh, they usually relate to the game changers. Some new technology emerges and then everybody adopted and the suddenly everybody is more efficient than me, then uh, you are so behind. So, or some unthinkable events like a COVID happens last year. So, so our only way to, we can meet is through Zoom and uh, so that kind of thing so needs some new, completely new uh, so thinking or solutions. And uh, so of, of uh, uh, these continuous innovations, there are three kinds. One is a radical innovation, which is adoption of new technology to existing business model. So this is our case to adoption of Zoom, having the meeting and the disruptive innovation. This is opposite. You have same exact tools to solve the problem, but the, you apply to completely new problem to solve. And the uh, so combining of those new technology and new uh, so approach is so-called architectural innovation. Okay, here are some examples. So find your new solution using existing tools within your own research field. So the, that's the disruptive innovation. And the, so I want to, some, some people want to solve their own problem, but the, they couldn't find any good solution from the uh, existing, uh, so in your own field. So looking at others, other, I mean the other, uh, the, the other field. So the, the, that comes up with the introducing completely new uh, tools into the, your own problem. That becomes radical innovation. And sometimes your problem is too new. There is no solution exists in the world. So you need to make your own tool from the scratch off that becomes architectural innovation. So the basically everybody's doing their own innovation every day. And those I briefly mentioned about the, some characteristics of innovation. Innovation, again, is a process. So it has a life cycle. So it needs the uh, innovation needs to be changed, keep changing. So innovation becomes obsolete. So if you recall that uh, Motorola introduced the razor cell phone. So that was so cool because it looks so cool and there's a button was cool, but that, at that time, so Motorola dominate the whole mobile phone market. Everybody had one but I couldn't because it's too expensive for me. Anyway, but today you couldn't find any Motorola phone at all. There's no, virtually no Motorola 
mobile phone these days. So the innovation at that time in early 20s uh, becomes too obsolete right now. And there's, so the company is almost dead now. So the research is the same. So if we do same thing every day, then that becomes obsolete. And then, so we need uh, something new every day for in terms of especially research activities. For grant proposers, innovation is actually proposed. If you have all those innovation already realized, then there's nothing to do in terms of grant proposals. You better submit a patent to protect whatever you achieve through the process. So the so innovation for grant proposers, innovation is proposed. So there's a purely subjective opinion. So that needs to be justified enough to persuade the reviewers to agree with you. So there's a, don't be discouraged to brag about whatever you feel new to others. So, so you can just present whatever you feel new as a proposal, but if you justify enough to persuade the leaders, which is the reviewers, then that works. And nobody knows at the proposal stage. And uh, in the same way, adoption of other field technology need to be justified to create a new solution that never existed before, or they can create a completely new value for the grant proposers. But uh, some as, uh, in nursing practices, you don't have to justify to adopt the new technologies like Zoom. So because everybody is doing that, but in case of Zoom, so it already showed us the value. But uh, by using the Zoom, we do something for research and uh, that could be pretty uh, innovative to the reviewers about two or three years ago, but now it may not be. Okay, so, so now I'm talking about who am I and then more so talk about how I can help you. Okay, I so I got my PhD degree uh, from UC Berkeley in mechanical engineering in 1997. And uh, I studied so-called mechatronic systems. And uh, that is the implemented as uh, uh, autonomously driving vehicles these days. And I actually I got a PhD out of it. And I worked on hard, hard disk drive. And uh, also I work on the uh, tem uh, Johnson controls, uh, thermometers, uh, HVAC systems, etc. And I also served as a director of mechanical engineering lab at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And uh, through, as a director, I thought I taught students about the sensors and computerized measurement system. So if you have a, a so, if you want to have a study using sensors or so how you want to approach the sensor vendors or, and all those kind of questions are just to ask me questions then I can help. And also I taught uh, experiment design, mostly more like an anobot design, but the uh, uh, 1980s when the Japanese uh, suddenly uh, so excel all other countries in manufacturing, they uh, introduced so-called Takuchi method. So it really reduced the number of experiments to get the same results as the ANOVA design. So that, that is the one in used in engineering and they really helped the Sony and Toyota and Honda improve their reliability very in short period compared with the United States industry. And also I work with uh, a lot of nearby industry companies to solidify the 
uh, solicit the projects for undergraduate students. So those I can help the, in your case, if you bring one, bring me a nursing problem, then I can help you talk with the engineering expert to present together, uh, present your problem together with me. And uh, throughout the uh, last 20 years, I've been the uh, four NIH funded R01 projects as a core iOS IPI. And the most recently is 2019, I completed NCI Sprint program. That is the eight week entrepreneurship training program provided by NCI National Cancer Institute. That through that eight weeks program, so I had hand-on experience uh, so to uh, create a startup company. So, so the throughout the so course, I had the training with the customer discovery, value proposition, business model generation, and then finally meet met with the venture capitalist and the NIHS VI program director. So the, those are the spectrum of uh, areas I can help with. Okay, so mechatronic system is so-called mechanical system with the electronics. So the, this is a mechanical system. And then overall, everything here is the computer and sensor together. So although this information making a closed loop, so the information from machine goes into electronics and make a decision and then going back to machines through the actions. So this structure, so we need to look at the cancer pain management at the time uh, Dr. Im was uh, working on. So I propose the same approach to look at the cancer pain management as a closed loop system as shown here. So the pain, pain is assessed and the healthcare provider is making decision and the make a treatment provide to the patient. So the, through this new approach, we propose to create a never exist solution to a never try the problem. And then it was in, implemented through uh, internet platform, so the it has a wide range of beneficiary as uh, to the uh, our own solutions. So, so I like to talk about where to start. First, you look at yourself and then check if you have any problem to solve or want to improve something. If you don't have, then you don't have to do anything, and then define the value of the solution and implement, implement, implement you want to solve. And second part, check if you can solve by yourself. So that, that so the, if you can solve, solve all your problems within your existing tools. And then check if, someone has already solved a similar problem, achieve an improvement, then try the same thing to your problem instead of making everything by yourself. And if there's no existing solution, then you need uh, some serious research. So the, all this fourth stop is uh, where to start the innovation process. So here's uh, how I can help you. If you have a problem to solve and want to improve something, then contact me, then I can e examine the problem with our engineer's view. And also I can help you define the value. Sometimes when I talk through some other people and the, some people does not realize the value they are actually providing from their innovations. If you have a solution, if you, if you can so solve the problem and achieve the improvement by yourself. Then what I can do is that I can stay away from you and not to bother you. And if someone else already solved a problem, similar problem 
and achieve the improvement and try to apply the problem, then I can have to evaluate those potential technologies, especially mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, industrial engineering, and computer science and chemical engineering area. And if there's no existing solution, and I can help you as a multiple PI or co-I. In summary, I want you to become a fairy godmother, fairy mother. So she can help someone in need. So like a Cinderella by providing the solution, which is a, is a pumpkin cart through the all those existing tools or new tools, which is the one magic as realized by the wand. Okay, next step. So contact me with your problem with the following homework done. So you need to first define the value to be achieved by the solution to the problem. So the, if you don't know the solution, and but the, you know the problem at this time, but the, with the problem, you want to actually find a solution to achieve certain value. And uh, also you need to complete the review of what others are doing. So, the, so we don't, uh, I don't have to redo the work for you. Okay, so with that homework done, then you can contact me through the email or as a join HIT core using this QR code. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Wanchik. Sorry, my, I couldn't get my mute to unmute. Um, any questions for Wanchik? He's given us, um, and it was really interesting as you were talking because I was, I was hearing different terms, but similar concepts um, to significance and some of the steps that we take in developing uh, research. But I think um, seeing this, seeing old problems through a new new lens or seeing old processes through a new lens can help to um, enhance creativity, which I think is a big part of this. What, what, what questions so far for Dr. Chi? Yeah, if you have a question, just send me an email. That's certainly an option. Okay. We will move next then to um, Dr. Chandler and she's gonna present some of her um, research or innovative work. And I'm trying to find Dr. Chandler on yeah. my screen. There she is. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, everyone. Hi, I am Rashida Chandler, and the topic for this presentation is Equitable Access to Technology Health Solutions Developed for and by Black Women. As Drenna stated in the introduction, I have a number of projects uh, on going right now, so I hope to be able to highlight at least an uh, element of each, but if I can't, um, I hope to at least give you some tips and tools for how I've navigated the innovation and technology space. So the primary, primary objective of my presentation is to actually explain my current technology projects created for Black women and some bonuses uh, I hope to convey is how you can retain momentum on your tech projects when you have little to no more money. I think I'm an expert at that right now. <laughs> and also indicate some sustainability suggestions for technology tech, tech interventions because um, there is a heightened request from funders, especially about how you're going to sustain um, any of the technology that they fund, they want to know that, that it's actually going to be implemented and used in larger venues. So here's an outline of the different projects that I have ongoing, which is my prep savvy study. I'm in the know. I want to give you a recap and some um, updates on that. Uh, I am a part of a team CIS, uh, in some of our projects that have innovation um, intertwined within those. 
is PM3, which was recently funded, and also a maternal mental health and tech pilot that we're doing, as well as an STI HIV home testing and telehealth pilot that I'm engaged in. So to start out, I will talk about Prep Savvy. The initial pilot for Prep Savvy was funded through Emory URC, uh, Emory URC grant. And we are looking now to have an R series grant fund the next steps of this. But preliminarily, um, some of the work, this project in and of, of itself was about prep for black college women, particularly who attend HBCUs. And a little bit of background that will be the underpinning for all of my work is around the disparities that exist with African-American women and um, sexual and reproductive health disparities compared to other women in the US. And so uh, it's no different for HIV um, as well as other STIs that black women are disproportionately impacted. And so PrEP is, or pre-exposure prophylaxis, prophylaxis, excuse me, is a viable recommendation for effective way of preventing HIV with this population. And so we want to heighten use potentially with this population. The, pur the purpose of this particular study was to create a pilot HIV PrEP education program that would identify PrEP as a potential HIV preventive option for Black female college students. Um, and we did pilot it here in the Atlanta met metro Atlanta area. So we partnered with HBC local HBCUs here. And what we did was we developed two contextually equivalent delivery um, through two different modalities, in person and online. And it was about a 60 minute uh, educational module, both online and in person that we implemented with these women. And we did a pre-test, then we did the intervention, did a post-test and about a week after they, they, ha they had the um, curriculum. What we wanted to look at and determine was whether or not um, women uh, increase their intentions to actually use PrEP um, and also increase their knowledge and um, about HIV and also PrEP. So this is a snapshot of what the online group would see. And I was very fortunate to um, secure a, a artist to um, that you know, I contracted with who created all of the, the uh, visuals that you see with uh, my presentation and also that was included in the actual online module. So I kind of use them a lot since I paid for them, but um, they came, they come across really well with our population. Um, as far as the results, we did recruit 43 black college women attending HBCUs in the Atlanta area. 23 were engaged with the online version and 20 were in the in-person version. Um, overall, most of the women were sophomores or juniors um, as far as their uh, academic status and they identified as heterosexual and single um, primarily. Uh, a note about in-person sessions, we did typically hold them during morning group sessions with no more than 10 individuals on campuses. Um, so to as to make it convenient for those um, individuals and the depictions here in the, the circular um, pie graphs are uh, just kind of a reinforcement of the information I just provided. So pre-test, um, I won't I won't read everything verbatim, but basically the groups um, didn't differ much as far as demographics were concerned. But I will highlight that in the both the in-person and the live group that most of them had never heard of PrEP. And that um, if uh, one of the questions we asked was if PrEP was available today, how likely is it that you will use it? And most of them were either unsure or somewhat unlikely or extremely unlikely. So from not sure to unlikely to, to actually use it. But after they received our module, they um, reported, um, and we did have them evaluate the actual curriculum itself. 
And so we asked how helpful was the program for understanding PrEP and 80% thought it was very helpful um, in the in-person group and online. Um, again, over 80% thought it was either helpful or very helpful. Quality of the uh, PrEP program um, for the in-person group, 100% of them felt that the quality of it was excellent. And then for the online group, still the majority, but 52% felt that it was excellent. Um, useful of use, usefulness of the PrEP program, 80% felt like it was excellent and 65% um, in the online version thought that it, it was um, excellent. And then one of the things that we were really excited about was how likely are you to take PrEP in the future? Um, for the in-person group, 70% was, was somewhat likely, excuse me, and in the online group, 65.22% were somewhat likely. So we really felt good about that. And um, we, you know, we felt that our curriculum did impact their decision about potentially in initiating PrEP. We did also do focus groups and we were able to recruit um, 10 from each of those um, particular modalities, delivery modalities. Um, and so some of the concerns were, were cost associated with the medication. Um, they felt like the drug was a little bit too new. Um, it kind of came across as experimental to them. Also side effects, and they weren't that thrilled about um, taking a pill um, once a day. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic about some of the new uh, preparations, the uh, injectable that's coming out, because I think that will be a viable option for this population. And obviously the medical mistrust that um, unfortunately tends to haunt our community. So um, that did show uh, come up in the uh, focus groups as well. One of the things that they, the women in this particular study did highlight that they appreciated it being trendy, timely and targeted and so very familiar context. It was certainly geared to, for, toward a college audience and so the content did um, resonate with this group. They want, um, they did highlight the need to have clinician connectedness about, you know, sexual and reproductive health topics and um, particularly about providers who look like them. And this is kind of a common theme with a lot of the information I get from um, women um, on a lot of these topics. And also they, just to de demystify sex and put sex in a positive context, um, as opposed to always having it just um, be stigmatized or um, something that uh, people uh, shun or make you feel embarrassed about. So where we're going now with Prep Savvy is um, we are now revamping it to create some more dynamic features because because the online version we really want to take the online version on the road um, kind of and we want to make it more dynamic because before it was just more reading it, it was um, interactive in a way so that it wasn't just like content thrown at you. There were characters and they were dialoguing, but you had to read that. We want to do things like voiceover and also make it more visually appealing. So we're looking to um, revamp that part and also reevaluate the surveys um, to uh, possibly add additional information to collect. Um, we are finalizing collaborations with other HBCUs to potentially integrate this into their student health services and also um, in a way that we can um, get, get data about how effective it is. Um, we will be securing IRB approval and um, before we implement this project. And just to highlight some of the places that we are in conversation conversations about implementation. Um, again, our partners here in the Atlanta area, but also Winston-Salem State University and North Carolina a and in North Carolina. So that is Prep Savvy in a nutshell. And um, Jessica, please let me know. I don't want to run over. Um, as far as In the Know is concerned, it was initially funded by R25 through the UCSF um, visiting professorship that I'm a part of. And um, 
I want to recap just a few highlights. Again, the background is very similar to what I discussed before, um, but the purpose for this particular study was to determine the preferences for functionality format and design of a mobile reproductive reproductive health and HIV prevention app, and to also examine whether they this population would be willing to actually use an HIV prevention app. And so we, so here's a, here's a highlight, no cost option. You know, sometimes when you don't have the funding or not don't have enough funding, um, I was able to secure a partnership with Spelman in their mHealth course. And we had um, some students to create uh, wireframes and we were able to use those wireframes as demos for our focus groups. So, that is a way to kind of navigate and keep your, your work going. Um, we recruited from a local uh, community-based organization and we did also have some students from Emory participate in some of the focus groups. Some questions that we did prior to the, seeing some of the, um, seeing some of, oh, sorry, I thought I heard someone speaking so so uh, maybe it's so just a while i just do a nurse at least this we put some more specific please mute your mic if you're not thank you some of the pre-prototype review questions were general about um, why would someone start using the app what mobile apps do they currently use how would you like to hear information about health topics important to black women so we wanted to make sure we weren't kind of doing our own thing we really wanted this to be um a participatory project so that women had a voice in the work that we're doing. What After we did the, the, the pre-demo um, questions, we also, then we demonstrated some of the um, prototypes where we, we would demo, demo the prototype and then we would ask some post questions, um, which consisted of what did you like about the app? What did you dislike? What would you change? So those are some examples. As far as demographics, we recruited 23 Black women, meaning <laughs> of this population was 30. Most of them were not married. They had completed high school. They did have some form of health insurance. And um, because we, our CBO is um, a point of care provider, they, um, they do cater to women who are under an and uninsured, so many of them were recruited from there, and so they, they went there for care. Um, just really quickly highlighting that the women want to have reliable information that comes from a digital source, so um, they want it to also be very comprehensive and not just exclusive to HIV, which we have taken all of those things into account. Um, being able to order co commodities at home, like HIV tests, um, maybe prep startup kits. Um, some of those things are in the works or um, being piloted. Um, so there are options that people don't necessarily have to come to the clinic for. Um, some of these other ones are not necessarily unique, you know, wanting to have things customizable um, to your personality. They wanted to know about how to get to HIV testing sites and prep clinics, et cetera. Um, and also if there were means of having uh, transportation options that could be shared within the app was also a desire. Um, again, imagery like me, that comes through everything I've done. Um, and then also security concerns, just making sure things are secure, especially with sensitive information. Um, I won't belabor this, but they did want it to be compatible with all forms of uh, technology, including iOS and Android. Um, I think that, and that's pretty much the most important part of that particular slide. And then where we are now, uh, we, again, another um, advantage of that I, you know, took, something I took advantage of was that I, again, am waiting for funding and hopefully we'll receive funding. I do have a grant in for um, to, to continue this work. But right now I'm moving forward with the beta app development. So moving past the wireframes and now to the beta app 
version of this that's operable and can actually be used. Um, and I was selected by Georgia Tech students who, who have a requirement of creating a final product for um, two semesters. And so we're in semester two. And so by the end of April, I should have a beta version of my app that can be used for the feasibility testing. Um, and again, I should hear something in April about my R34 for moving forward with feasibility, acceptability, and usability testing. Um, just a brief acknowledgement of my team. It does take a team to do a lot of this stuff. And I do want to highlight that um, I'm very fortunate as far as a sustain, from a sustainability standpoint, that um, within the CBO, there is a national, uh, affiliate, national affiliation with an organization that um, has agreed to potentially integrate um, this particular tool into their services if we see that it's feasible, acceptable, and do additional testing with it. So that's a sustainability element that a lot of funders are, are looking for now. And that's in the know. Where do I stand on time? Because I, I have a couple more, but I don't want to be disrespectful of, of time here. We want to pause for a minute and see if there are any questions so far. Yeah, sure. Guess not. <laughs> oh, oh, I have a question. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't get my thing unmuted. Hi, Dr. Chandler. Um, thank you so much for presenting this today. It's of great interest to me and I'm sure many of the researchers that are joining us on today's talk. Um, I did have a question about, I noticed when you were looking at the PrEP um, in-person versus online groups, I wanted to know what do you think contributed to the gap in usefulness that people found? I think it was about 80% in-person versus um, down near 50 or 60% uh, on the online groups. Mm -hmm. Are there things that you guys explored or um, would you suggest that researchers explore in the future to help reduce these gaps? Yeah, I, I do think that um, just even going back to my dissertation work, um, that in-person kind of that personable contact is a lot. A lot of times uh, people just want to be in the presence of others when they're um, tech talking about these topics potentially. But also, um, again, one of the limitations I feel of the, the actual modules that were online was that they, it required so much reading. It was not um, as engaging or animated as I would have liked. And I think that um, could have improved the, um, the re reception to um, that particular point around the online version. So that's why we're looking, and yes, in the focus groups, we did ask about that. And that was kind of what we, um, we got was that, you know, it's a lot of reading. Um, people are so visual now, especially when it comes to their, um, with, when it comes to competing demands for their time and energy. So being able to expedite them, um, getting through the modules without having to read all the content themselves, like voiceover. And so we're, we're making those adjustments now in the second phase of this. So yeah, I do I do think those were limitations for the online version. Thank you, Dr. Chandler, for sharing that. Um, one follow-up question. I know you mentioned different routes to engage people during the modules. Um, has your team done any exploration of methods like gamification of the content? And if so, um, do you suggest any resources or any particular people who are um, who you've worked with in the past that would be knowledgeable to bring to the table for gamification? So I absolutely recommend gamification if you have the budget. <laughs> we didn't necessarily have the budget for that. So we are doing more of a stepwise approach to it. We, again, now are trying to make it more dynamic, but again, there are constraints related to budget. So um, yes, I mean, I would love for it to have been... Um, and I will say this, we did have an opportunity to do some things that help for it to be interactive, but not as gamified as I probably would have liked. And again, that depends on budget. And, and I will say that students are, um, 
especially in the spaces where I'm now um, privy to and being engaged with as far as Georgia Tech, because I have actually two groups now that I have two apps with Georgia Tech students. And they, and you know, if you want to have something gamified, that's probably a really great uh, place to start, especially if you don't have the budget. But budget can dictate a lot of, a lot of these things. Um, and so that was a limitation because of, trust me, I have broad dreams about how um, interactive I, I like my technology to be, but my budget always um, rain, rains me in a little bit. But yeah, um, gamification is a great um, idea. And I would suggest that if you don't have the budget, that maybe some of the student paths might be helpful because they're they tend to be pretty savvy, especially in the, if they're already immersed in the tech space. Thank you, Dr. Chandler, for your thoughtful responses. And I will definitely be reaching out to you more to figure out how to engage uh, students to assist in these processes. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for the questions. Um, I think I have a few more minutes to kind of talk about PM3. This was just recently funded by Johnson & Johnson. Um, and it is a development and evaluation of mobile or M health technology to optimize the postpartum transition of care among underserved black mothers in rural settings. And so just brief, we'll, I'll go over a little bit of background, not a lot, some of the conceptual frameworks that we're using, the approach, um, and a little bit of an update of where we are. And we'll move from there and wrap up from there. So this is a team, it's a huge team effort on this. It's prevent maternal mortality using mobile technology, PM3. And um, we are, I'm collaborating as a um, MPI with, excuse me, Morehouse Georgia Tech um, and Georgia State University on this project. And Sudeshna is also on this project with us and also uh, Sierra who's from Georgia State and then these are our, some of our research assistants who's helping out and so, so some of our aims for this uh, project is to further develop and refine the PM3 mobile app intervention with rural black women. We will then conduct a, an RCT uh, of PM3 and then we will evaluate the PM3 intervention using REAIM, that framework. And so we are using and structuring this particular project around the Sojourner Syndrome and the Sojourner Syndrome framework derived by Millings aims to understand the Black, um, the way in which the hierarchies embedded in race, gender, and class operate in the lives of Black women and interact to produce health consequences. We're also using the maternal morbidity measurement the uh, MMM mod framework, and it is a multi-level framework that takes under a comprehensive exam examination of contributors to these issues, highlighting the types of measurement that are needed to capture everything that matters to women, healthcare providers, and policymakers. And so there, it's like six points listed for that, but for the sake of time, I'll move on to our approach. It's extremely community-based, um, participatory research or human-centered design, which to me can likely be interchangeable. It's just human-centered design is um, very around the tech part of it, but it's all about including your end users in the process. Um, so it's a very equitable partnership and we are working with rural counties. Um, Daltrey out of, and in Albany, Troop for, um, in LaGrange, and Burke um, out of Waynesboro. And we have um, partnerships um, in all of those areas. And we have assembled our community advisory board with the majority of the CAB being the rural black women. So they will have the uh, predominant voice in what happens with this app, but also providers and support persons um, will be on the CAB. Um, our aim is to do formative work. So we're in the process right now of um, ramping up our um, um, focus groups. We're gonna actually implement focus groups with um, the rural black women, healthcare providers and support designees. And then we are then going to actually 
uh, build out the app and do some feasibility testing of the app. Um, one of the things around human-centered design that I think is important is that we have created user personas, which, which help us to visualize who the individuals who might use this app are and try and think about um, how this would apply to a real person's life so that um, we can um, be thoughtful about how development occurs and that it will be likely or um, a useful tool for women in their real lives. So we do have um, some a wireframe of this um, developed and we will again develop the prototype and it, um, it's a beta version um, after the focus groups. This is kind of our RCT framework. So we'll be recruiting, screening, um, they'll be randomized to uh, intervention group and then a control group, which is the standard uh, postpartum um, information that they already receive. And then we'll also do some assessments. We will um, also be doing re-aim by evaluating this entire process to see how we can improve it um, for next steps. Um, again, we have gone through the Institutional Review Board for the first phase of it, and we have gotten memorandums of agreements and understandings out, um, community presentations to our uh, community partners. So it's a lot of leg work that we're doing just to start up processes right now. Okay, and then briefly um, with my team, we are doing a maternal mental health survey that we deploy. So the objective was to determine mental health experiences during COVID-19 and take and non-tech resources that were, for, were they were referred to or that they used during this time. And we've already um, deployed the survey and um, we are now collecting data on that. And I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> So thank you for your time. Thank you, Rashida. Thank you very much. Um, questions for Dr. Chandler. This is Jill. I have one, Rashida. Thank you. This was absolutely fabulous. Um, and I have one question. You don't have to answer me right now, but you can ask me later today. Would you be willing to give us some classes on how to do presentations like this? This is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Sorry, I felt like I was like talking a mile a minute trying to get it all in. But. Mm -hmm. Rashida, I'd be interested to know, you sort of linking your work to the introduction that Dr. Chi gave. How did you get started with this? You know, sort of what was the early phase problem that you identified and what led you to pursue um an app, you know, sort of mobile app tech tech base um, approach with this particular problem in population. Sure, great question. Um, when I did my um, my K, I did um, an HIV prevention kind of. Um, it was a module setup where we did uh, several. Um, engagements with college women at two different locations. And um, they, they received the in-person well, but when we spoke with the women um, in, about how to improve the program, the conversation about technology started to emerge which kind of sparked my interest because not only were they interested, but I was running all over the place. I was literally- um, <laughs> Right, the problem was there's only one of you, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. it's only one of me. And I was in Tampa, I was had my first child during the time my study was going on and the other women were at the HBCU in Tallahassee. So literally like I was managing both of those and delivering my baby. So, I mean, yeah. So that that had a lot to do with it too. But the, the point to, um, and the major point is that um, the women did uh, make that suggestion. Gotcha. And like, yeah. Right, right. So we went, we took it from there and ran. Okay, thank you. Any other questions Thanks. for either Dr. Chi or Dr. Chandler? 
This is Erin. I just want to say to Rashida, this is so awesome. I've been waiting to hear about this work um, mm -hmm. that you're doing. And I just think it's awesome that you'll see all the comments in the chat box too. That, um, there's a lot of people saying that. So good job. Thank you so much. I put a comment in the chat, but I'll just say it. I've really enjoyed seeing your work evolve. And um, I do have a question or um, maybe something to think about is, you know, I think about, and this is for, is for Dr. Chi or you, is how, how do you think about um, the alternate group for an RCT? You know, so when you have, <laughs> you have this beautiful technology, you know, what do you give the control group or the attention control group? So just how do, how do you think about approaching those types of things? Uh, I don't know, Dr. T, if you wanted to, to answer that, I don't wanna um, dominate, but I can just say from, my, from what I've um, done and what we propose, um, for example, for the PM3, we're just going to do um, for the control what they typically get, um, which is usually like a, a packet and kind of go home and read it um, type of thing, um, just to compare it with, with what's existing. But I know that there are um, some instances where individuals might use another form of technology, um, like an existing app to see if their app um, you know, kind of is, is a better option or um, heightens um, the opportunity for individuals to have a better uh, health outcome. So, I mean, I know that there's a couple different ways and I've gone back and forth depending on the project with which I might choose, but um, yeah, um, it kind of, it depends on, um, on what, I guess, the topic and what it is you're trying to achieve overall. But Dr. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. Dr. Chi, if you want to chime in, I don't know. I'm sorry. I didn't want to dominate. I know. So I think I saw you. You're doing uh, correctly. So I don't have anything to add. Should I give my 730 experimental design lecture, Rashida, for this question? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> we're teaching that class together. Well, I mean, the, the control group depends on what research question you're asking. If you really think that the delivery via mobile app is key to your outcome, then you need to have, um, you know, a, a comparison group that has a similar attention, that has a similar, you know, mobile experience. Um, if, you know, if you think that um, the, the delivery doesn't matter, the content is what matters. And so, you know, think about the mechanism of change that you're, you're attempting to measure if you're at that stage. If you're not at that stage and you're really just trying to see is something better than what's already out there, then you would compare it to a, um, a standard of care control group. So it's, it's, it's really about, you know, backing up a little bit, I think, and thinking about what is the key question that you're trying to answer and then setting up your research study so that it can answer that question. And I apologize to my students in 730. They've heard this before. <laughs> I, do, Thank I, you, use, I use Prezi. I use Prezi. Someone asked what mm -hmm. platform I use Prezi. So I have seen some interest in the chat in the um, HIT core group, the information technology group. So Dr. Chi leads that. So um, please reach out to him to find out about how you can get involved. And I, like many other people, enjoy this tremendous, tremendously. And thank you so both so much for sharing your expertise and your ideas and your creativity and your willingness to um, help others. And um, on to the next Zoom meeting. So thank you all. Enjoy your Tuesday. Thank you.